Perfect. All right, let's kick this thing off. Welcome back to this week's episode. I'm here in Zoom land with Sid Gupta, co-founder of Nesh, product designer and builder, and data nerd. Sid, I have to ask, is data nerd self-proclaimed or did someone tell you that you were a data nerd? I could just call myself that. Data told me that. <laughs> <laughs> the data told me that. I like that. I like that. Well, man, welcome to the show. The last time we uh, saw each other was we were just talking about was that Digital Wildcatters event here in Houston known as Fuse. Um, but before that, I think it was February of 2020 when I had you um, on my last podcast, Oil and Gas on Shore, which was, um, you know, and we talked about Nash and all the fascinating things that you were working on, which at the time I think was still relatively, you know, again, I think it was somewhat in startup phase or you guys had recently kind of launched. Um but then since then, you know, we've had a global pandemic, an energy crisis, uh, you know, you're in the technology space, which right now, you know, technology has kind of got an interesting challenge that it's facing along with markets in general. But um, I have to ask the first change. I noticed on your LinkedIn, you have New York. Did you move to New York at some point here? I did. So I Congrats. Spent, thank you. Yeah, I spent half my time in Houston and half my time in New York now. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, t what's the story behind New York? Uh, it was it was sort of more of a personal move. So, uh, my 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 wife she got a new job, which was based in New York City. We both oh. wanted to kind of always live there, at some point. So, decided to move up. Uh, still have our place in Houston. So, kind of split our time between. A lot of our customers are in Texas, so I keep coming back. Some of our team members are here too. But New York is awesome. So, loving it so far. That is badass. What part yeah. of New York? We're in Jersey City, so technically uh, not in Manhattan, but like a 15-minute train right away. No way. Okay, yeah. so, man, I, I've only been to New York once, but my experience there was awesome. Um, I, I, love, I love the city, right? And, and I feel like yeah. New York, like any city within the world that has something, I feel that New York has it as well. There's nothing there that no one else has that they don't, relatively speaking, of course, depending on you know, beaches and all this and that, but even New York has some, has some ocean, but I mean, man, what, what's your favorite part about living in New York? I guess not having to drive. That's the best part. I think like in, I, we do miss our cars sometimes, but we kept our car here in Houston and then just public transport there. This is the freedom of it. It's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was there, you know, of course, typical tourists, right? We stay in, um, uh, the main part downtown why am i forgetting we're drawing a blank help me out with the big all the lights and all the movies are filmed there what's in in manhattan what's the main oh, like uh, wall street like yeah wall, wall street yeah um uh, town not town square oh times square times square yeah i totally drew a blank yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah so we we stayed in times square so of course everything was just like prices were through the roof but to be able to experience times square and we stay, we went there right after thanksgiving so all the lights and just the magic of christmas and you know, there was, you know, we saw Seal performing at the Lego Center and like all these random things, man. That, <laughs> and, and my wife and I, we, we like shopping. And so, you know, of course, that's a big part of it. And uh, it was just, it, it was just a very magical experience and just the energy that it had. And then we took the, those little red buses that they, you know, for yeah. tourists to go around. Mm -hmm. So we got to see, you know, we got to see Brooklyn and we got to see this and that. And um, I just, I, if, if, you know, given the opportunity, assuming we're in the financial position to do so, I would love to have a place in New York just to go for, um, whether it be weekends or even like during the holiday seasons and in the summertime, it's beautiful, uh, from what I understand. Um, but anyway, no, that, that's really neat, man. And congrats to your wife. Hopefully uh, it was a good opportunity. I'm sure it was, or you wouldn't have moved, but. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's been, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, we love living there. We miss Texas. So, uh, but we always have a home here, so I keep coming back. Uh, yeah, the weather, it's our first winter there, so we'll see how we come out of the other end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You may end up requesting to come back, but yeah. I think you'll manage. Um, before we keep going, I do want to remind the listeners that I'm currently opening up sponsorship opportunities. So if any energy-focused companies are looking to increase brand marketing, visibility, and messaging, please reach out to me. I'd love to chat about an opportunity with, with you. Um and so for the audience, so normally I like to kick off and say, oh, where are you from? And how'd you get into this and that? But I mean, we kind of already did that. Um, so for the listeners, if you want to get to know a little more of, of Sid's background and, and energy and his just his journey in entrepreneurship, I encourage you to go back to episode 56 of Oil and Gas Upstream uh, to get to know Sid and his journey. But uh, I'm going to kick things off, Sid, to just kind of open up the the uh, the space a bit. And 
I'm curious for you, what, do you have any core beliefs around industrial technology that you've changed your mind on over the last few years, or it could just be technology in general? Um, we've gone through a lot of changes. I'm sure you've had to pivot a few times since we've spoke last, but have, have you had to kind of recalibrate and reposition yourself on, 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 on the lens that you look through regarding technology? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I think about it, it's like technology enables like people's uh, behavior and and what they do, right? And uh, one of the key shifts that we have seen is how people work in this kind of post-pandemic world that we're living in or, uh, yeah, the, the kind of like so many shifts have happened. Like two main things that we have seen is uh, one, this whole great, great resignation and great reshuffle that has affected people who, kind of knowledge workers, essentially, folks who look at data, analyze data, interpret data, and make decisions off of that data. So a lot of movement there. The second thing that we have seen is um, uh, the whole working from home and the hybrid working environment that we're living in. So people are communicating very differently with each other. We are kind of sending a lot more emails back and forth with each other, sending a lot of chat messages with each other. So these two behavior changes is kind of, and there's no water cooler that doesn't really exist anymore. We are, we aren't kind of sharing a common space to talk to each other. I know different companies work in different ways now, but that's the general trend. So yeah. those two things, when we look at it and because Nesh plays in the space of like knowledge management, knowledge, knowledge retention, we have seen a lot in how the technology needs to adapt to this new working culture and how people work. Uh, Interesting. No, it's and, and you mentioned that, and and I would say from your observation and experience, because in my bubble, which in I work, you know, we're we're mainly back at the office, um, and so those those opportunities to be whether it be in the kitchen or you know the, the as you say the water cooler talk, we're starting to see that a little more. But the beautiful thing about it is, you know, it, it's you're you're not required or looked down upon if you say, hey, I'm gonna need to work from home today. Um, and, and I think what we've done well is, is we've done some, and I say, we, I'm speaking in super generalities here, but have done a, a good job of adopting to, uh, somewhat being able to qu quantify the performance output for remote environments. Now I wouldn't say it's perfect. Some companies probably better than others, mm -hmm. but, um, for you and Nesh, I mean, was that something that you found as an opportunity or or more more of a hurdle and and can you describe kind of those two to either or yeah for us like you're asking for us or for our customers or for us uh, for, for, for us, you yeah. guys as, as a yeah, company yeah. yeah i mean for us we never for before the pandemic we never considered hiring people outside of houston right we were always thinking like we have to find the greatest talent in in the 50 mile radius around here which was like a very myopic way of looking at hiring and then when when remote working happened, I mean, it kind of opened up the whole world for us. I mean, our team is much bigger than the last time, last time we talked, but then also like 80% of our team is outside of Houston, outside of Texas even. So it we just have a lot more like high quality talent. They just happen to be in different places and we were able to tap into it, which is not unique to any of us. I think every company kind of went through that shift, but it opened up our eyes and how we hire and how we work and tr still trying to figure out as a startup, how do you kind of build team culture and all of that when everybody's remote? Well, and that's, that's one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm big on. And I would say a lot of people are, but I, I really try to look a little bit dive deeper into sort of work culture and, and what it takes to build culture and people. Uh, and, and so, you know, something that I've always said is it's hard to build culture and, 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 increased density of relationships when you're always virtual. So, I mean, do you have any um, tips or advice for say companies that like a smaller companies that do, whether it be outsourced or are very much spread out geographically that are really, uh, you know, just folk, you know, really having to, to use technology and virtual meetings and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think technology does enable a lot of those things to kind of happen. Uh, I mean, there's there's a technology element to it. It makes sure that there's opportunities for people to kind of have conversations like over Slack or over Teams or something like that. Uh, like having chatbots in your Slack that can kind of inject 
humor into day-to-day life saying, hey, what was the last thing you ate? Or what was the, show me the last photo you took on your phone and things like that. I mean, it's just uh, this like conversation yeah. that you can create. So there's a technology element to it that can help automate some of these things. Uh, there are other parts too. It's like, and most of it needs to kind of come from the top in, in some sense in, in small companies is to make sure that like people know that they are safe, that they're taken care of uh, in, in your organization. And then they can kind of like uh, share share their thoughts openly with each other and then creating opportunities to kind of talk about it, to have more one-on-ones uh, and uh, encourage other people to kind of have those one-on-ones with each other. Yeah. And then create opportunities to talk about things outside of work too. So we try and do some of those. And again, I, I'm pretty sure we're not perfect. There's a lot of things that we can improve, but uh, having opportunities to, for people to kind of do some sort of online gaming sometimes once a week or, oh, cool. uh, or you know, like meet for a happy hour, virtual coffee or something like that. Yeah. And having so no agenda I, during these calls. That's, I mean, I'm, those, these are a few things that I, I haven't heard of um, and, and which I think are great. And so you, you, you mentioned gaming, like you know, getting together and game. Are you a gamer? I do. I mean, not not too much, but whatever time I do have, I'm a console gamer. But yeah. Okay. So, what's Sid's go to game? If you got an hour and you want to bring the team together, I mean, what are you guys playing? Oh, when we when we play as a team, we generally try to play something that is like uh, like it's not like a, something too complex. We'll play like uh, code words or or like we have a couple of other like Pictionary and things like that, which yeah. is like not too intense you're still talking you're still laughing you're still cracking jokes that sort of a thing if i'm yeah. playing on my own i'll play something a little bit more serious again. okay so if you're in you know in a dark room and you've got an hour to unplug and then replug into the gaming world what what's sid's go-to game i mean i play a lot of like rainbow six and uh ah, okay quantum break and i mean like like a first person sort of a, uh, games those are good ones yeah man that's great i i do you have kids I do not know. Okay. Well, you know, once I, so I used to play, I was a big Madden guy. I'm, I'm into the sports uh, and yeah. grew up playing some Halo, but I, I always, yep. you know, just love, love Madden and, and NBA 2K and stuff. And, you know, before I had kids, I, I, I had that those small breaks of time where I could just like zone out and game. And uh, now that I have kids, I, I think the last game I played was something on my, my son's tablet. And it was like dinosaurs <laughs> launching rockets into something. And, it's, you know, not something I would have picked right away, but, yeah. uh, man, I, I encourage you. And, and the reason I'm, I'm kind of joking, making light of it, but, but focusing on this is like, I encourage you, man. Like now I don't know what your family plans are or whatever, but to, to really embrace those times that you do get to, by yourself to unplug and do those kind of things. And, yeah. you know, we, when we were at fuse, we had, uh, you on as, as, uh, as a, as a panelist to talk about what, what people don't tell you about the startup world or what it, I guess the truth behind startups or some to that, uh, you know, right. effect, but you mentioned mental health, which, you know, that could be a whole nother episode in itself. But again, just going back to that is it's like, it's so easy now to be plugged in 24 seven, just because of technology and, you know, the globalization of, of business and, and, and industry and everything else. It's like, you could literally spend 24 hours a day working if you wanted to, like, there's no, no one at some point, someone in the world is like it, they're on the clock. Uh, and, and so, uh, again, I, I hope, hopefully you do get a little Sid time to game and then just, just enjoy the things that you, you know, probably did growing up and now you're probably finding less and less time to do it, but no, that's, uh, that's cool. Man. Are you last question on the gaming thing, but I'm curious, are you Xbox or PlayStation? Xbox. My man, virtual yeah. pound. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's cool. So, um, so I, I want to get a little bit into the uh, the challenges that exist within technology. Um, you mentioned a couple of them before we got started, but I think it's important to discuss. So the the question being, I mean, what what do you think is the biggest challenge that you feel exists in the technology landscape, and more so around because technology is such a broad term, right? But like more so some of the stuff that that you're involved with. That I'm involved. So I mean. Uh, f- what Nesh does, we are like a knowledge management platform that captures expertise from experts and tries to create a, a virtual avatar. You can think of it as like a digital twin of an expert that people can go to when the real experts are unavailable, right? So that's that's what we do. Now, for us mm-hmm. to do that, some of the things that need to happen. One is being able to kind of understand how people speak, how they write, and and kind of making sense of it. So we use a lot of natural language processing. So that's one element of technology. The second is uh, how do you get people to share knowledge? 
a uh, lot of times we have seen that knowledge is used as a currency. Um, that is your value. So why would you want to share it with somebody else? So it's called knowledge hoarding. So how do you kind of get past knowledge hoarding to get people to share information? So that's another element of technology. Can technology solve that? Mm. I would say those are two of the biggest challenges that we have seen is uh, being able to understand human language and make sense of it. And NLP uh, is such a cutting edge area in machine learning right now. So a lot of our team members, I'm I'm not an expert in NLP, but a lot of our team members are. So they spend a lot of time in doing R&D to understand like large language models and how that can help us parse human thoughts and human speech. Um, the second element is actually more tricky uh, because that involves changing somebody's behaviors. Like how do you get somebody to share knowledge with, which they don't intend to otherwise or uh, or there's no incentive for them to do it. So that's another element we've been, and we are still experimenting to see how we can do that. But there's certain things that we have tried uh, sort of like trying to gamify that process. And again, kind of going back to the mm. gaming thing, right? How do you, if you can gamify that process to get people to share knowledge and uh, huh. and then instead of asking them to share a whole lot of things, ask them to share something very specific and very small, which is easier done. So those are some of the things that we're experimenting with. I don't know if that's and that answers your question, Justin, but those were the two. I mean, I don't know if it's like a technology answer, but those are two of the biggest kind of challenges that we are currently working through. Yeah, well, it's, and again, well, no, and you did answer my question. And I, and I think, like I was saying before, um, I was with uh, uh, one of my customers yesterday and, and one of the vice presidents was was talking about, because um, we were talking about th there's a certain uh, technology company within oil and gas that does a fairly decent job, but he was he was voicing, I guess, some of his concerns about like their limitations based off, they only have access to what they have access to. And there is little data sharing. And he was mm -hmm. saying, oh, if they could plug into so-and-so's data, it would make their outputs and, 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 and their deliverables a lot more fine-tuned or I could actually make better business decisions. But I feel like I'm, you know, if I want, like I could use them, but then I also need this company. And I also need this company because I need them to get this feed into yeah. this and I need this to feed into this. But because everyone's, like you said, like hoarding, you know, their knowledge or their data, it it, it limits our ability to kind of, and I say it limit it, it sort of inhibits the growth rate of at which you can adopt technology and then in and, and utilize it to, to benefit whatever companies it is. But I would say, what, like, why do you think people are so, like, do you think it comes from leadership and and perhaps it, people think they get an, a comp competitive advantage by not sharing things that they know or knowledge or data, or does it come from like a level of insecurity where it's like, oh, I'm going to, you know, if people know what I know, then I'm not as valuable. Like, do you think it's sort of a, do you think it's a characteristic issue or do you think it's more of like a business competitive advantage issue or I mean, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, the, there's a couple of things. I mean, the, the situation that you described with your customer that you were speaking with was more of like organizations sharing knowledge across each other, which is a lot harder to do than even sharing information within a company and mm -hmm. we, yeah. we we try not to solve that problem because that's like a lot harder to kind of get companies to share information with each other. That's somebody else's battle to fight. But for us, we work within an organization and even within a company, we have seen like one person might not want to share knowledge with another person. Uh, and okay. that that's like, okay, well, I know this stuff and I want to be the go-to person for any of these questions, right? If I If I just disseminate that information with everybody else, then my value diminishes. Mm -hmm. So we have seen we have seen some personas like that. We've also seen people who are on the other end, like they document like crazy. They would write a lot of things to make sure that whenever they go on vacation or they go on some extended leave or they res retire or resign, then everybody else has access to that knowledge. So they they are documenting every day. So we have seen both of those extremes. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to say what drives them i'm guessing it's just like personal motivation of like how they perceive value of them some people don't want to be pinged again and again about the same thing so they'll just document and point people to hey go read this stuff i've already written it and yeah. some people just love that interaction that's what gives them satisfaction no i think you're 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 touching on a lot of good points there and i think again through my experience and observation 
the ones who have been very much into hoarding or, or I guess, hesitant to share knowledge. And again, this is just my observation. Typically those folks have a high level of insecurity uh, and who really aren't, or are, are, have a tough time. A, I, I, that aligns with, they don't like training people to take their roles. They really want to stay in their role and they don't want anyone taking their, their role because for whatever reason, but then the ones who are very much willing to, to share what, share the wisdom and the knowledge that they know, those are the ones that are eager to move up and to say, Hey, I, I realize that in order for me to advance, I need to train someone highly skilled to take my role. So then I can take somebody else's role. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to insecurities and that's again, totally my observation. You play in this world day in and day out. Um, but I think it comes down to, again, like self-awareness and, and understanding, um, kind of where you sit within your own level of, of, of confidence, but again, could be totally a bunch of other things. Um, but you, you mentioned earlier about, you know, the ability to, to quantify the value for knowledge, which is an interesting topic. I haven't, I mean, I don't know if there's papers on that, but that's, that's something that's not really talked about. I'm sure people go into that pretty deeply in, in maybe the academic world, but can you speak on what, what your thoughts are around that? Yeah, I mean, quantifying knowledge loss or quantifying knowledge retention or just overall knowledge management is a is a tricky thing to do because obviously the first thing that comes to mind for everybody is like, okay, if I if I can get answer to a question whenever I need it, the first thing that it saves me is time, right? That's the that's the most obvious go to thing that it saves me time and I can do something else with my time. So that's the first kind of value proposition is like, it'll save you time. But again, time doesn't necessarily translate into money right away. So how do you con- how do you kind of quantify it in a better way? So that's where we have to spend a lot of time with our customers to understand like how they perceive the value for a specific knowledge management implementation. And we have seen a lot of different value vectors come out of it. I mean, things like if an ex-employee leaves the company, oftentimes they come back as a consultant. Mm-hmm. And they often come back as a consultant at a much higher rate than what they were employed at. So if you can capture the knowledge very well, then maybe that consulting cost can go down and you can only hire them for very critical stuff, but not for an extended period of time. So mm-hmm. that consulting cost can go down. So that's one value vector. Another one could be uh, you can onboard a new person coming onto the team much more quicker. So instead of them having to shadow somebody all the time, they can onboard themselves on their own terms and they're on their own time and they can get on ramped maybe in like two months instead of six months. So their productivity goes up really fast. Mm -hmm. Then another one that we have seen is that uh, this was really interesting for us when we, when we first found out that one of our customers saw that their team members who had like three to five years of experience were actually almost operating and behaving like they had six to 10 years of experience because they had all this knowledge available to them whenever they needed it, they could actually use it and perform better at their jobs. So Mm -hmm. what that means is you're hiring somebody at almost like a lower uh, grade and they're performing at a much higher grade. That quantifies into a lot of value. Um, So yeah, like customer satisfaction goes up, product revenue goes up, your customer support team's efficiency goes up. There's a lot of different ways to quantify it, but I mean, it really depends on where you're applying the knowledge management workflow to, which part of your organization you're applying it to. Uh, is it across the board? Is it for your customer service team? Is it for your technical services team? So I think those are some of the things that we need to think about. Hmm. So speak a little bit on, on give, give us a sort of a, like a, the scope at which Nash does. So let's just hypothetically speak at companies listening to this and saying, wow, you know, this, this is all really interesting stuff. So where, where does Nash plug into? And then how do you, um, like what's the value proposition for Nash, Nash coming into a company and, and helping with a lot of these challenges or issues or, or what exactly is it that you do to, to help? So what Nash does uh, is it, captures expertise within an organization and creates virtual experts for somebody to go ask questions to when real experts aren't available. That's the overall kind of idea behind Nesh. Now, how do you apply that? Most of the customers that we work with, they apply they apply Nesh to something called technical services. So technical services is a broad term. Uh, and uh, what that means is wherever your organization interacts with your customers in a technical way 
that's like, I guess the easiest way to kind of explain technical services. So this could be for support that if your customers have a technical question, they come to you with that question. How do you answer that? That's one thing is the technical support. Um, another area is, uh, for example, is um, services. So your customer, your, you provide some sort of a service and you're looking to see how you can improve the, or how you can find more opportunities to improve that service or upsell that service. So that's another place you're interacting with the client and trying to discern that gap. Uh, then another area could be quality assurance. So your company makes a product and that product is used by the customer. The customer sees some deficiencies and they want to troubleshoot that or they want to, or you as a company wants to improve the quality of the product. So that's the quality assurance team is pretty close to the client. So that's another place to apply it to. So um, onboarding of a new person who is coming on your team. Uh, those are, that's another area. So there's, there's four mm -hmm. or five different places, but if you're kind of thinking about where the most impact for a software like Nesh can be is to think about uh, where does your organization in, it comes closest to the client. And if you can unlock all the knowledge that your customer needs so they can get answers to their questions quickly as, as possible, that's the most impact that you can you can create. Hmm. That's uh, that's really so. So, if a company hires Nash, is it then a, a separate platform that plugs into some of their, uh, I guess, databases or what? How do their the logistics work with with that? Yeah. Well, so the way Nash trains itself and creates this oh. virtual expert is kind of it goes through three steps. The first step is to read all the content that an expert has already written. So these could be like experts have written a report or they have created a PowerPoint in the past or they have written a memo. So these are usually in like PDFs, PowerPoints, Word documents and things like that. And so Nesh will read through all of this. There could be millions and millions of these documents and then Nesh will kind of read all of this and try and synthesize how these experts think, what they say, or how they make decisions and so on. So that's mm -hmm. the first step is reading anything that has been formally documented. The second step is uh, looking at things that are being talked about within the company, but hasn't been formally documented yet. So it could be like emails that are going back and forth between you and me or chat messages that we are sending to each other over Teams or Slack. So you can bring Nesh into those conversations and she'll learn from all of these informal talk and chatter that is happening. Uh, and then the third step is trying to uh, understand what is in people's heads that hasn't been documented or talked about at all. Oh, wow. so, so the way we do that is by asking those users or those experts very small but very specific questions. And when they answer those questions, a small part of the knowledge they contribute to Nash and Nash learns from that. So these three steps and it keep repeating itself again and again and again. And that's how kind of Nesh builds up the knowledge about like how these experts are kind of thinking and behaving. Wow, that's fascinating. That's quite a bit different than what you guys, well, it's different from what I remember, but it, that is a fascinating uh, sort of journey that you guys have gone on and, and are embarking on. I'm curious on the, on the document side, because this is, you know, just thinking within the company that I work for, um, to, to me, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, if, if you're, for us, we have a lot of technical documents, a lot of white papers, mm -hmm. a lot of product data sheets, a lot of this, that, and the other. And a lot of times, yeah, if, if you're trying to, if, if you're someone who hasn't been part of the company for very long, it's like, A, where do you find these documents? B, who's the right person to ask to, 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 to capture some, some, or to get some answers based off of some of the stuff that we've written. Uh, so that can take a lot of time, but I mean, to me that, that, that solves a, a pretty unique problem that I think a lot of companies face. But what I'm curious about is when, when Nesh, you know, say takes a thousand documents or whatever and, and synthesizes it and, and then who, who validates to make sure that there's like at least a decent level of accuracy that the information is, is, is correct. And I mean, obviously it's correct information, but the way it organizes, it may not be accurate if you know what I mean, or maybe it yeah. is, but I'm curious on that front. The user ultimately does because we as an external customer or external vendor have no like 
no clue what is relevant to right the domain exper expertise domain is experience. not quite yeah. there but right yeah correct yeah so the way we do that is we rely on the users to validate it so nash has oh, sort okay. of like a reddit reddit like capability built into it where people can there are moderators and people can essentially upvote and downvote things as as they come in to make sure that only the relevant and the high value stuff surface itself at the top and everything else gets pushed down so we crowdsource that wisdom from the company to make sure that all the knowledge that has been organized for them and is being found for them is actually correct. Wow, man, that's uh, that's really fascinating. What would you say right now is, is your biggest limiter for growth? I mean, is it is this when you're talking to cu potential customers, is this something that, I mean, you just can't keep up with or, or what are some of the common questions and, and how do you respond to these questions? I think the the biggest hurdle is what you asked earlier about like quantifying the value for this because people see that this is a big problem to solve. Mm -hmm. How do you put a how do you put a if I solve this problem, how do I put a dollar amount on it? And then how do I stack it versus the other problems that I'm trying to solve in the company? Uh, that's the biggest thing is like we need to make sure that we can communicate very effectively the ROI for something like this. Yeah. So do you guys capture case studies and, and do you get testimonials or ways to be able to quantify to where if you're giving a pitch, you can say, well, according to the data, because I'm a data nerd, of course, uh, <laughs> here's what the data is telling us. You know what I mean? Like, how, how do you how do you capture that? And are companies willing to take because it takes it's it's one thing to to be successful, but then it takes even more resources to capture the success, organize it and then put it in a unique sort of in, in whether it be marketing material or, you know, tell the, st it's always about telling the story because, right. you know, I, I'm, I'm in sales and, and, you know, I play hand in hand with our marketing team. And when I'm going to sell something, I need to tell a story on a, why it's like, how it's going to solve the problem you're facing. Oh, what's, you know, of course, where's the, where's the ROI? Well, if, if, if I can capture uh, and uh, 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 a circumstance that it helped a company save X amount of dollars. Like it, dollars are the easiest thing because it's everyone understands dollars, right? And so, um, I don't know if I was specifically asking a question, but to to the point is like, how do you? Yeah, that's what I was like getting at. Is like, how do you actually capture these these success stories? And is it more of like an objective? Here's what they did, and here's how it helped. Or are you able to tie back dollars, or is it kind of case specific it's yeah so that's a that's a good question because like case studies ultimately i mean even if you tell what the success story of a of a, another customer has been like how did they, like how did they get how did they get to a value what that journey was like needs to be yeah. captured very well so what we try and do is almost try to make it formulaic in a way that here's what this customer did here's the value that they received out of doing this and how did they get those value? And here's a formula, how we calculated it and how we validated it. And we tried to take that formula and almost put it into an Excel file for this new customer to say, okay, well, here's a, here's an Excel file. If you plug in numbers that are for your company, you'll get a representative value for your, your organization. So tell me, tell me how many employees do you have who have more than uh, 25 years of experience? Tell me how many new people you're onboarding every year. Uh, what is your churn rate look like? How many people are retiring from your organization every year? How many people are kind of just separating for other reasons? So things like that, they fill in like a, a, a form and then it tries to give you an approximate value based on what we have seen from our other clients. Ah, interesting. I, that's, I mean, you guys went the extra mile to, to build it because yeah, you, you give some inputs and hopefully, you know, they can quickly evaluate it and, and hopefully give them, enough data to make a better decision or say, oh, wow, this is something that could help instead of you just pitching it. And, and it's like, yeah, this sounds great, but what's in it for me? Like, how, right. how can you, how, how can you validate what you're telling me is actually something that's happening right. or could happen? Um, yeah, I know that that's really interesting. Uh, kind of pivoting on, you know, I talked about storytelling and, and the marketing aspect. I mean, how important for you guys is marketing um, in terms of like, do you have sort of initiatives to, to tell the story to say people who haven't heard of you or is that like, how important is that part of it? And how important is, you know, the branding and all of that, or are you more focused on, is it more boutique to where like the customers you do have, you're more so focused on that or are you in like growth mode or 
how how is some of that coming along we we actually we we used to do a lot of marketing in the past like maybe about like before the pandemic i would say like that's when we focused a lot on marketing to make sure that people knew about nesh and what we are up to and then honestly i mean just through the pandemic and through the dynamics of how the market evolved and where the where we needed to focus we decided not to spend too much dollars and time on marketing instead of trying to be very focused and have more outbound and business development going on versus like trying to create a lot of inbound interest. Interesting. Gotcha. Has that been worth it? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, which has worked out fine, but I think we, we will want to start investing in marketing again. We have good product market fit. Now we're able to see kind of where, uh, where our customers are coming from, who are the users who are using it? What is the pain point they were solving? So we have good messaging. We just need to kind of nicely package it up together to, to send something out there. Makes sense. Uh, I I would imagine maybe some of the questions or even for the folks listening is, and again, I I know it's very company specific depending on headcount and all the rest of it, what kind of industry it is. But I mean, do you have an answer for if someone's like, hey, how long? Like, let's say I'm I'm a company of a hundred people. We're relatively spread out. We've been in business for fifteen years. Whatever. I mean, I'm just throwing numbers out. Um, how long before I actually see some benefit here? Like, do you need to be collecting data for 10 years or like two months? Or, I mean, is, is there any way to kind of answer that question to, to, so that people can say, wow, if I invest X amount of money within a few months, I should be seeing something. Yeah. Uh, Like one thing we've seen is like, there, there has to be enough, enough knowledge inside your organization that it is chaotic that's when uh-huh. you actually start feeling the pain that you want to solve this thing. And in our experience, we've seen if you have more than 200 to 500 employees, that's when things start to become pretty chaotic. If you have less than okay. 100, then you can kind of manage with like folder management and all of that. I mean, I think it'll still be fine. Uh, yeah. you, can, you can somehow get by. But if you once you cross that threshold of like 200 to 500 employees, there's enough knowledge floating around and enough people moving in and out of teams that you need to have some sort of a knowledge management practice in place. So that's the first thing. Yeah. Now, now you have the pain. Now you start solving it. We've seen like in about three months of implementing a solution like ours, people start seeing qualitative benefits. Okay. Uh, not quanti- Not quantitative yet. They start seeing things like people's burnout reduce because they are not just always hair on fire running around trying to find things. It's easy for them to go look for a piece of info whenever they need it. Yeah. Uh, they see like satisfaction of customers go up uh, by a certain points. In about six months, they start to see more quantitative benefits. They start seeing uh, some NPS scores change. They start to see um, customer satisfaction go up. They start to see um, customer service efficiency change things like that. And in about a year, they start to see more kind of long-term consequences. They see product revenue go up. They start to see quality incidents come down. They start to see kind of regulatory uh, impacts go down. So yeah, I would say like probably from somewhere between three months to a year, that's when you start realizing some early value and then about a year to realize some kind of late, late effect. Makes sense. Um, And you don't have to tell, say the amounts, but do you ever find when you go in and pitch it, if and people say, yeah, this is interesting. I mean, have you, have you figured out the right price point for something like this? Cause I would imagine there's not t- too many people in, in like in the market that are doing this. Like, I don't know how many competitors you have, but has, has, has fine tuning the price point been difficult or is that not really an issue for you? Oh no. I mean, pricing is one of the hardest things to, to <laughs> nail down. Right. I mean, you've, you've, yeah. I'm sure you've seen that it's, it's been, it's been a, it's been a journey for us too. It's like trying to, experiment with different pricing models and uh, yeah we are we feel good with where we are right now but we are still kind of looking at optimizing that to make sure that the value that our customer gets is aligned with the pricing that they are paying for that uh, yeah but yeah i mean we we have experimented with some of that i mean we do compete with customer we do compete with other vendors our solution is usually compared to enterprise search uh, it is also compared to other knowledge management tools. Mm-hmm. Our kind of core differentiator is that we focus on heavy industry, so we understand the domain very well. Oh. Uh, but we do we do have competition, so we have to make sure that we are we aren't being priced out or or something. Like of course, 
No, that's, that's interesting. I'm always, I was curious again, as a, someone in sales, I'm constantly getting beat down on pricing. So I, I'm always interested <laughs> on to, to hear other people's experience on that, but uh, we're coming up close to, uh, to, I know you got a hard, de- hard stop here and, and certainly want to respect your time, but um, kind of going, you know, taking a step back, taking the business side out of it. I want to ask another question for you more on the, on the personal side of things, but I mean, you know, you've been running this company now for, you know, I don't know, maybe what, four or five years or so. How long have you guys been in business now? Five years? Yeah, four years. Four years. Four, four years. Okay. So, I mean, you've been you've been blowing and going. Four years probably feels like, you know, two years uh, underwater or treading water. But uh, do, you, do you have any sort of daily habits or routines that help contribute to your success to, to keep you focused, to feel, be recharged um, versus like, you know, you mentioned burnout and that's, I think as a, as a startup founder, I, I think that that happens probably more so than, than we'd like to, to, to admit, but um, how have you, how have you managed stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm guilty of a lot of things that uh, I'm sure other founders are for too, is like being able to let go of responsibilities is really hard as a startup founder, because when you're early on, you're doing every single thing in a company. And as you start hiring people, you just have to let go and know that they everyone has a different way of functioning. They do different things in different ways. So trying like trusting that process and then making sure that every, you, you, whoever you hire actually has the full authority to do what they do. So this was something that took me a while to learn. And then also kind of comes with like, as you start hiring really good talent, you know that they will do a good job. And we have had, we have had hiring fails. So making sure that you know how to hire well. And when you do hire well, how do you empower that that person? I mean, the second thing is just like, I'm a task-oriented guy. So whenever I get up in the morning, before I start working, I make sure that I have a list for the day that I want to accomplish my goals. Otherwise, it's just the day becomes very hazy and I just jump from meeting to meeting to meeting without having any specific mm. things achieved. Gotcha. So that's how, just- how do, you, that's how do you prioritize that? Because I know a lot of people write a list but then I've heard within the list, some people prioritize it like A, B, C, D, or they'll they'll not they'll have three things that are like absolutely hundred percent critical, and the rest are just if I get to them, that's cool. Like, do you have any way of structuring the list? Not too scientific. I mean, if I if it's a if it's a customer if it's an existing customer thing that that probably goes to the top. If it's something in the pipeline, then probably goes next. Um, if it is a uh, if it's a team member and I'm blocking somebody from doing something, then that probably comes next. So there's some sort of a mental model that I have. I don't think there's any, I, I don't think I apply too much science to it. Just kind of go down that list and whatever gets done, gets done next day. Otherwise that list kind of starts over again. Right. Which, I mean, if you're like me, I, I, I same thing, I have a list and it's, it's very dynamic because things come up and all of a sudden it's like, boom, this is priority. Uh, but, but again, it's just, I always find it interesting sort of people's uh, systems and processes they have within their, their ability to, to do work. And so, especially as founders, I mean, it's just, uh, diving into that for, for is, is selfishly always interesting to hear guys like you. I used to, I used to use the app, like a to-do app to do this first. And then I realized that there's no satisfaction in just clicking a box. Same, so <laughs> man, I told, I, so on my phone, I have, you know, notes, I have iPhone, I'm Apple guy and, and, and I can do the, the checkbox. Right. And so I was like, I'm going to create a virtual to-do list and it same thing. I don't know if it's, I'm an eighties baby, man. So it's like, you know, everything in school was still pencil, paper, pen. And when I have my, my, my pad here, uh, when I have, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I can just check it off or cross it out. It's just, there's that level of intrinsic satisfaction that I get. I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm accomplishing something. And then, but on the phone, it was just like, I'd click and it would disappear. And I'm like, okay, I guess the next thing, <laughs> you know, it's like this weird thing, man. So yeah. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Well, that's- look, I know you, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that's a that's a weird like we had the same quirk. I I realized that just like that satisfaction of just checking it off and that's that's yeah. something. Oh, I can't wait till my kids uh, get into their careers and and I'm still carrying around my little notepad with a pen. I'm a, I'm a pencil guy, man. I, I just I love having a pencil. Um, maybe it's the engineering behind me and, and engineering paper and whatever because a lot of erasing happened, especially when I was in school. Uh, but uh, they're gonna be like, Dad, I can't believe you still use paper and pe- and pencil. What do you you know? But uh, man, th- this has been good. Uh, 
really appreciate this, Sid. And, and you don't have to spell it out, but what what links do you want me to put in the show notes in, in terms of getting in touch with you? So obviously website, you know, maybe LinkedIn. Do you have any other platforms that are are for the for the listeners that they can click and and, and look at? No, I think those two are good. I mean, LinkedIn uh, for if you want to connect with me or connect with Nesh or and our website to get some back, more background information on it. Yeah, those two should be. Yeah, that's that's plenty. Perfect, man. Well, this has been great to catch up. And Sid, I, I wish you nothing but the best up there in New York. And, um, you know, obviously you're traveling quite a bit, but safe travels, happy holidays. Um, and, you know, I just hope that everyone lives a, a, a prosperous, healthy and happy 2023 for you and your family. And for the listeners out there, always remember, uh, if you want to sponsor the show, please reach out. And until next time, remember that everyone deserves access to energy and we is greater than me. Thanks, everybody.